Before I start, a short warning, I'm using open source software which doesn't really work properly. So it probably at some point will get stuck in this PowerPoint and then I'll uh, et cetera, et cetera. But um, that's that. Um, it's a stolen computer, by the way, so it's not that I endorse Mac in any way. This is a symposium on biotechnologies and bioart, but um, as you already know from the introduction, we are starting with digital technologies, and I'll slowly try to move those into a realm where this boundary between biotechnology and digital technology um, dissolves, and particularly I'll look into how this boundary might be um, kept up. So when we think about, and these are a little bit unclear, um, consumer technologies, we, we tend to have images, and also if we think about advertisement and the whole culture around it, these images are prominent, right? The devices are depicted and experienced and imagined as almost always new and expressing a sense of futurity or at least perfection and cleanliness. What is often outside our imagination of these devices is exactly this, that what happens to the devices once they are discarded. A point in time which is often not so distant from the point where we acquire them and use them, right? A lot of the, uh, nowadays, uh, a laptop is discarded after maybe uh, four years, uh, a mobile phone even after two years, and some companies are advertising with one year. So this interested me very much, because also if we think about digital arts, um, and particularly the work of, for example, Stellark that was referred to before, um, usually this is not part of it this realm of debris is excluded. So how are we supposed to um, understand this? How does this come into being? And what I would suggest is to go back to um, the um, economic crisis in the United States in the 1930s and Bernard London's um, paper, which you probably know, or at least the concept, um, ending the depression through planned obsolescence. What Bernard London suggested here is that in the 1930s, where um, the problem was, one of the problems was uh, enormous production capacities and declining demand, what Bernard London suggests is to look into how can we make people buy more products, even though we are able to produce products that last forever? One of the problems of the T-Ford was that um, they lasted pretty much forever. So somebody would buy a T-Ford and in 10, 20 years it would still function. So what Bernard London starts suggesting here is that instead of designing articles as durable as we can, so as good as we can, we should actually be designing them to last for a particular amount of time so we can secure continued demand. So in other words, uh, the light bulb is the most famous example, right? You design a light bulb not as, as good as you can, so it can last for years and years and years. You design it deliberately so it only lasts for a thousand hours and then people buy a new one. Nylon stockings is the same idea, right? They could last much longer, but as most people... Um, not most men, but you no, know, they rip all the time. They could be much better, but they're designed like that. Now, something quite interesting has happened in this logic uh, of, pla of plant obsolescence, right? Because if we think of the light bulb and the nylon stocking, they're designed to break, but the consumer also perceives that moment of breaking as a very material thing, right? My light bulb is broken, I can actually see it's broken. It's usually black and the thing is loose. The nylon stockings, you can see they're broken. Now, if we think about some contemporary digital devices, how do they break? An interesting example is the inkjet printer. You've probably all experienced after one or two years, um, suddenly it says error or something like that. The printer itself, though, still looks brand new but it's broken. How does that work? There's a little chip inside that counts a number of pages, and one, once the number of preset pages has expired, the printer pretends to break. On the other hand, we have another thing. I have this phone. Uh, it's uh, two years old only. It's very slow. That's because the operating system keeps updating and makes the phone obsolete through software. So in both instances, we have devices that we don't necessarily experience breaking in a material sense, but they kind of break in a kind of magical sense, I would almost say. So what I suggest is that we've moved from um, a realm of analog plant obsolescence, where we see the material decay, to digitized plant obsolescence. So where the, the product breaks, but not through a materially perceptible action. Now, hopefully we can move on. 
Oh, there we go. So if we start thinking about this and go back to anthropologist Mary uh, Douglas' uh, book, Purity and Danger, um, and I'll contextualize planned obsolescence in this a bit later, what she argues in this book is that the notion of dirt that we have in um, contemporary Western societies, post-war, so to say, um, that their dirt is no longer something that we are afraid of for actually hygienic reasons, even though we often say that, and I think this connects to what William Myers was talking about yesterday, right? There is a kind of obsession with things being clean. Well, what she argues is that actually these actions of, of cleaning and keeping dirt out are actually symbolic. They're not, they're not necessary for hygienic purposes. They're symbolic. Um, dirt is matter out of place, so it's a sense of things not being organized. So what the regulation of dirt, what cleaning actually is, in the domestic space particularly, and in public spaces, it is a symbolic strategy to establish category boundaries. Um, so where we can actually uh, work with notions of defilement to negotiate power relations that are ambiguous. She refers to uh, examples from um, uh, uh, examples from Indian society where um, ideas of purity of food are also linked to which people from which caste are allowed to touch the food. If we think about, you know, a kind of old-fashioned uh, rural setting here, there's also a sense of um, dirt under your shoes. If you come from the land, you can't take your clogs into the kitchen. I mean, it's, it's interesting that once the, the earth is in the kitchen, it's dirt, but when it's outside, it's actually, you know, it's, it's the soil that stuff grows uh, similarly now, if I, uh, I, I cut my apple, um, as soon as the, 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 the peel is in the sink, then it becomes dirty. I don't want to put my fingers in that little hole and get it out, right? So there is a symbolic um, uh, realm around dirt. That's what Douglas argues here. And then she goes on from that because she looks at... Whoa. Okay. <laughs> This is really funny. Um, she looks at, um, um, at different cultures, also outside um, uh, the, the Western consumer um, uh, society, and she then uh, argues that there are dirt-affirming cultures, and she considers a contemporary United States in the 1960s, one such culture, where there is, um, the dirt is there, it's acknowledged that is there, and there is a ritual around it, um, for bringing it away to the rubbish heap. So in, in, a, you know, in consumer society, that just means, and particularly here, you've got all these little bins, and you put it in there, so you kind of start you know, organizing the dirt. It's very much acknowledged we have this dirt, and then it goes away. Similarly, in, in, in other, um, she would say, dirt-affirming cultures, you might have a ritual around um, menstruation, for example, which is acknowledged in the culture. Uh, and, and then, in fact, of course, it's you know, debatable whether menstruation is dirt, but that's the kind of she refers to. But on the other hand, she argues, and this is the point where the PowerPoint sometimes gets stuck. I found out I have to press the button hard. Yes, that's it. It went a bit But There's also then dirt rejecting cultures. And she only acknowledges or realizes or finds those cultures outside the West, where she says there are cultures where any notion of dirt is pushed away from the community. It's dealt with somewhere else. And she then argues that there we are, can actually talk about optimistic religions that are not acknowledging the way dirt and the kind of excrements and all the stuff that is discarded from a community, how they actually are in connection with the environment. So she calls it this kind of naive understanding of the world. And you, of course, get where I'm going with this, is that this transition from analog plant obsolescence, where we have a sense of, oh, it's breaking, it's bro breaking, there's this, this thing which is now still my light bulb, but it's also dirt, so I have to kind of negotiate that. I engage with, oh, what is this? This is a thing that broke. And then it goes to the heap of rubbish, where it is just mixed with everything else and has no longer any identity. I don't have to care about it. But we have a digitized plant obsolescence. I've got this printer. Looks nice and new. It works. One day it says it's broken, but it still looks like a perfectly fine object in a material sense. It stays around in my house for another 10 years in that condition, probably. And then one day I put it out, and it just goes straight from um, useful object to this um, condition of common rubbish. So 
And looking at dirt as a symbolic structure, I would argue that what we have here is through this logic of digitized plant obsolescence that we're constructing a so-called, I would say, symbolic order of technological progress, where these technologies, because of the absence of their perception as something that's dirty, that's broken, that's actually a material object, the things only become perceptible as a material object when they no longer work. When you look at your iPad like this, you know, you're always dealing with the information. When it breaks, it's a material object. This is gradually being removed. So there, these objects, these technologies like this one here, they start to represent only or be related only to the sense of um, progress, enhancement, connectivity, social networking, etc., etc. This is the computer did this. Uh. <laughs> huh? well, there we go. So, now, if we, if we think about this a bit further, this kind of idea of um, a symbolic order of technolo technological progress also nicely fits into what um, Marx already writes about in terms of commodity fetishism, right? The issue of commodity fetishism is that um, we relate to our consumer objects, our commodities, only from the perspective of an exchange value. How much does it cost? We disconnect it totally from um, the actual use value, but most importantly, labor. The fact that this was made by people, we don't really relate to that. Now, if we start to also not, no longer relate to it as a material object, that fits really nicely into that, right? Once this is only seen as a kind of magical thing that's always new, it's even further away from this um, uh, notion of, yes, this is an object produced by people, which ultimately goes, and that's what will move next, which ultimately goes to a rubbish dump where people are exposed to the actual materiality of this thing. So, that's that. I'm not going to go into detail of this, but if we think about um, uh, this rubbish, the material of these computers, there is, of course, a very real and, um, you know, biological dimension to this. And this is a, a project uh, by one of the investigators on the research project I'll talk about in a bit. But he went to uh, the market in Nigeria and got all these old computers and just uh, took them apart ground them into really little bits and analyzed the um, uh, toxic material, materials in there. He looked at copper and um, uh, lead. There's a lot of copper and lead in there, but of course there's also um, PCBs uh, and all sorts of carcinogenic substances in there, which are then um, ultimately, they don't really come out when we use them, but when they go to the dump, these are all um, radiating sometimes uh, symbolically or uh, sometimes uh, in the sense of uh, dust in the air, but sometimes also really in the actual uh, engagement uh, with the body of the workers, and they affect um, uh, bodies of people, of plants, of uh, anything in the environment. And this is where I will move into this um, research project, but also into an engagement with digital technologies from the perspective of these things being um, a material force in the environment. And the starting point for thinking about this was the observation that this research is done on the basis of going to this market, picking up some of this stuff, uh, analyzing it in the lab, and then uh, drawing, basing conclusions on that. Similarly, I did an art project where I went to Nigeria together with Jalili Atiku, a Nigerian performance artist. We went to all sorts of dump sites, across Lagos, and we looked for old computers on the dump that were from European companies. So we found a monitor from uh, Moody's credit rating in London, we found a computer from the NHS, National Health Service somewhere, uh, a mobile phone from Swisscom, all that kind of stuff. But similarly, we went there, we took the stuff, and we were away again. So there was no real engagement with the environment, or also not with the way in which um, these materials are exposed to people there. So what I started thinking about is uh, when I when I read uh, Ingold, can we apply this to um, re-engaging with the materiality of computers? So what Ingold uh, argues, he's an anthropologist, but he argues in this book, making and a whole. A range of other um, pieces of his writing, the kind of central uh, approaches that he argues that anthropology should not do 
um, what arguably art history has uh, long done, go somewhere and look at what's going on uh, from an outsider perspective, taking that data and analyzing it. Instead, he makes two points. The one is, you know, it's kind of straightforward. It's participatory research, right? You should study with people and learning through participation in the actions. If you want to understand um, certain uh, Bye. Um, <laughs> if you want to, uh, <laughs> if you want to, um, um, if you want to really understand interactions with environments and interpersonal interactions, you have to actually participate in these processes. And the other argument he makes, and that's key to um, what I'm interested in with these electronic um, devices, is that instead of the traditional view that people are conceptualizing forms and then impose these on matter. So, you know, I, I design a glass and then I make it by forming the matter. He, he shows that this is actually not really what happens. In reality, we're dealing with interactions between forces and materials. You know, I exercise a force on material, I try to form it, but that material is not willing. It exercises a force on me as well. That's why every single glass is different, right? There is a variation because there is not a sense of the, you know, this is not an idea that I impose in the world. There's an interaction between forces and materials. Once we start looking from this perspective at the electronic waste dump, we're dealing with um, people, I can I'll go on later, I actually went to work there with a bunch of people, um, exercising uh, forces on that stuff, but that stuff also gets back at you in the form of um, toxicity and all sorts of other things. And then Ingold, um, uh, oh, back, Ingold um, uh, looks at this from the perspective of what I referred to before already, that um, uh, he, he basically says, well, there are, there are approaches in anthropology that work like art history. So you go look at stuff and then you write about it. And he basically says, the kind of anthropology I envisage is appro approaching it from an art practice methodological point of view. So you're doing the anthropology. So taking that as a starting point, whereas Ingold talks about doing anthropology and archaeology by taking approaches from art and architecture, I thought, well, how can we deal with e-waste by using performance arts and digital art approaches in cultural studies and science. So that's the starting point of this project called um, Bodies of Planned Obsolescence, Digital Performance and the Global Politics of Electronic Waste. A mouthful, but you know, that's how it goes with those grants. Um, um, yeah, so um, a group of artists, cultural theorists and scientists, including myself, I'll go through some other people later on, uh, we got together and we went to three places. We went to Lagos, in Nigeria to uh, an electronic waste dump where we then asked people to induct us in the work they were doing and did that for two days. In Hong Kong, we went to, um, we actually didn't go to Gayu, we weren't allowed. We went to Hong Kong to an electronic waste factory, so a very different way of processing electronic waste. And then we went to London with the whole group, so with people from Lagos and from Hong Kong and some in Europe. We went to London where we visited um, a so-called high-tech e-waste recycling facility outside um, London, no problem. <laughs> so then underpinning this project, I already referred to Ingold, uh, was this, uh, this idea that, or this observation that in media studies, most of the literature, most of the activity analyzes um, media technologies but never really deals with the materialness of these devices. There's a lot of critical writing on how computers are used, but there's very little writing on, well, this actual object, who made it, where is it going, what happens to that. So um, uh, Maxwell and Miller, Toby Miller, he was affiliated with the project as well, they, they wrote a book on this, we wanted to take this further. So they basically, in um, greening the media, they basically highlight, yeah, media studies should also start dealing with the materialness of these devices. Then secondly, and this is a central tenet here, re-engaging with the, uh, whoa, it's getting busy now, um, re-engaging with materialness. So I already pointed out in science there is a sense of, okay, you go research that the electronic waste, but, and it was quite telling with this project, a lot of the scientists, they got really a bit squeamish about going to those, those dumps. They would usually just go there with their little plastic gloves and get a little thing if they wouldn't even just send their, their assistants to pick it up and analyze in the lab. 
And as you know, you know, every science paper has a recommendation section in the end. These recommendations were often a little bit out of touch with what's actually happening on these dumps because the, the scientists had a really sophisticated and intricate way of engaging with the um, uh, uh, biological and chemical side of it, but they didn't really actually um, have a scope of understanding of what it was actually done with that stuff and how it was processed and where it was dumped. Um, and then thirdly, that's what I referred to already, so to actually research these things through a shared practical and participative activity. And that activity then was, um, if it wants to go on, it's a picture coming, it's really hard. Oh, oh no, it's not really the picture yet. I'll go to the people later on, I'll show you some things. So, um, we went to this dump site in uh, Lagos. This is Shuli Chang. She's a media artist, you probably know her. She's at Transmedia quite often. Um, here we, uh, we asked uh, the guys to show us how they take valuable parts from the uh, circuit boards. So this is about taking the copper and the aluminium off, but also there is a big market around this dump where people repair electronics. So a lot of the recycling was actually really uh, geographically very close. We would take out um, uh, high, capacity, um, uh, 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 high capacity transistors and things like that were quite expensive, and the TV uh, repair guys would come to the dump and collect those. So they didn't let me do that right away because they were afraid I was going to break too many of them. Um, there's also here the, the, tra just the, the transportation of um, uh, scrap iron and things like that across different sites uh, where I got an induction in how that's done uh, most uh, practically in these places where you can't really move with a cart. And here I'm taking out um, copper wire from used transformers and that's a Julie Atiku here um, who's sleeping as the son of the, the kind of manager of the site. This was something that became quite prominent that um, you know, I kind of come there with like a kind of Western Protestant uh, idea that I'm uh, 10 minutes, yeah that's fine, I'll make it. <laughs> and I, I of course went there and I really went for it and started to hack away like non-stop whereas the reality of the, of the workspace there is that it is a kind of mix of um, not only mattresses, but there's a pool table there as well, and a kind of TV that had salvage. So it was a continuous flow of um, working and then uh, engaging in some social activities, or in this case here, sleeping, because it was the middle of the day. At some point, there was only a few people left working. And here is in Hong Kong, totally different environment, as you can see. Uh, this is Shuli again, taking apart uh, laptops. And here is uh, Neil Maycroft, a cultural theorist from the uh, University of Lincoln, who is dealing with the uh, uh, desktop cases. And uh, this is uh, Chris Williams uh, from the London Institute of Education. And I'm in the back, slaughtering the devices. So, um, and I'll go, as I promised, quickly back to the list of people we, that were participating here. So I, I was uh, leading the whole thing. It's still going on, but we just had a one-year funding. We'll see what we do now. Uh, Janet Chan was a toxicologist from the University of Hong Kong, so that was quite fascinating to work with her because she had totally different perspectives on this. Um, also, of course, also something, something that came up yesterday, uh, you know, scientists talk in a very different uh, way. She always wanted to know if I wanted to uh, propose uh, an activity, so what, what, what are the objectives of this and what are the research questions? <laughs> um, Jalili Atiku, a uh, uh, performance artist from um, uh, Nigeria, Lagos, Shuli Chang, mentioned already, Neil Maycroft, uh, cultural theorist who writes on uh, peripherals and planned obsolescence a lot, Kehinda Olubandio, an env environmental scientist from Lagos. Interesting exchanges also between him and uh, Janet, because she works in a high-tech environment in Hong Kong, and, and uh, Kehinda was much more pragmatic. So when I, I proposed to have an experimental setup in our exhibition, Janet said we would need 200,000 pounds, and Kehinda kind of <laughs> fixed it together, and it more or less worked. And Iridi Papa Dimitriou uh, from the Vienna Museum, and and, um, Chris Williams, uh, photographer Peter Daman, who sadly passed away in the middle of the project, and um, uh, he made the photos we just saw, and Hannah Millis, the project coordinator. Now I'll go to the end. Um, so, the whole idea of this then was to engage in e-waste recycling work, not 
uh, in some sort of uh, attempt to uh, experience what it is like to be a recycling worker there. It's totally absurd, of course, because you know that we were doing it not to make a living, and we went home to a luxurious, you know, for local standards uh, hotel in the evening. Um, the idea was much more how can we engage with the materialness of these devices through an established cultural practice. So, and that's this, right? You could also go to, uh, you know, we could go to a side room here and just play around with computers for a day, but it's always then based on a kind of short-term playful thing. This is based on a, on a years-long tradition of how one takes apart these devices. So it's really the idea of an alternate way of dealing with um, electronic waste, with the materialness of the devices. So. Um, these workshops, yes, five minutes, these workshops were followed by uh, an exchange in which we uh, basically gave our individual impressions of um, the work. And we exchanged and uh, we mixed it all up. And then, this is uh, the interesting part for me anyway, we had an exhibition in which we showed all sorts of artifacts and outcomes. Um, it's not an art exhibition in that sense. It's much more an exhibition in which practitioners and theoreticians and scientists um, showed the outcomes of the project um, together. So what we have in here, for example, is uh, artifacts that we uh, found. So this is one of the kind of areas of focus that came out of this. It's not a project to come to any kind of conclusion. It was a, a networking project, so to say. We identified areas of further inquiry, so to say, or possible further inquiry. And one of the things we, we found out was that as soon as you start to actually engage with work in the place, I first thought we're going to bring loads of electronic waste back from Nigeria, like the first time. Of course, after you've done work there for two days or so, if you think, what should I take home? Those computers we have at home, right? What's interesting is actually what is different and what really is actually telling about how these devices are engaged with is the tools. So on the left, there is the tools from Nigeria. On the left is a machete. When machetes are no longer used, they also go to the dump, but not as waste, but to be used to hack through transformers, a uh, handmade hammer. And that thing on the right is most fascinating, um, the e-waste collectors, the scavengers, when they go through the streets, they make a specific sound, right? You probably know in Egypt, for example, when the gas guy comes, he hammers on the, on the, on the gas uh, box. In, in Lagos, that's the same. But for the e-waste scavengers, you have this. It's an old screwdriver. And these are the spindles from old DVD drives. So it's actually, it's actually the sound of the e-waste scavenger is both symbolic and indexical, because we also hear, we hear a piece of e-waste. And, and then here in, in um, Hong Kong, of course, the pneumatic screwdriver was kind of the key thing that we were working with all the time. So the contrast between this, because then we see here that these tools are actually traces of encounters between bodies and the debris of um, these devices. And there's a connection to local practices. And there's this sense of appropriation and hacking. I don't have pictures of that, but in, in the factory in Hong Kong, there were all kinds of ways in which people used old parts of electronics to store things, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that um, particularly also the scientists hadn't really considered is the, the dust that is everywhere. Also in Hong Kong, the, the irony was that um, in Hong Kong, there was a lot of dust inside the devices. But in the so-called high-tech factory in the UK, the dust was like, everywhere on the machines, and it was little, little Glittery and stuff in it as well. So um, it was clearly um, the whole uh, story was um, about high tech and health and safety in Britain. But we started to really see that there is also a sense of the performance of health and safety. A continuous narrative, like here, which you see here, right? This is the health and safety stuff in this factory in the UK. It's everywhere. But at the same time, it was a lot more dusty than even uh, the dump in Nigeria, actually, because this was the reality of that place. And people were not actually, and you can see that here, these ladies were actually working in that space and they're not wearing mouth protection, funnily enough. Um, so so th those things played around. I, I showed you yesterday, this is kind of going towards the end, but um, I developed an interest in this idea of the waste cyborg, right? So in the exhibition was this old vacuum cleaner, which is about as old as I am filled with household dust from my um, apartment. So the idea here was, again, um, a cyborg is a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism. So if you consider that skin flakes are 70 to ni or, or uh, dust, household dust, 70 to 90% skin flakes, this is actually a machine that is filled with you know, uh, parts of my body, and it kind of interacts. So kind of play with that, so to say. Um, 
And then lastly, here, oh, there we go. Um, this is what I touched on before already. For the scientists, what was very interesting for them is that um, the, the ethics of their work is very much that they're not allowed to do anything that's harmful to the body. So the whole idea of the lab is that it's totally sterilized. And now suddenly they were engaging in a methodology which was definitely bad for the body. I mean, not that we we're going to die from it, but we were there in a place where people were burning plastic cables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Kinder especially started really considering how can one um, take into account the ways in which people engage and touch these, these um, uh, materials in uh, methodologies for actually uh, researching the toxicology. Because before, he would just grind up the whole computer into little bits, disregarding that some of the parts would be burned, some of the parts would be touched, and some of the parts would remain intact. All right, I'll skip this. I'll show you three of my own pieces very briefly. This is a thing that came, it's over there actually, it's the high-tech wound. I worked on this dump for two days in, in uh, Nigeria, and as I said already, I, w I went for it, so it was very hot and very dirty, so I got prickly heat, but then immediately after that got uh, infected as well, because it was a very uh, dirty environment. What interested me here is that for me, it was exactly that Ingold story, right? I go there to do stuff on this dump, and I end up with, with something thing that actually uh, uh, performs on my body, if you like. The electronic waste, or at least the environment in which the electronic waste is processed, is acting, is performing on my arm. This is a project I did uh, for Transmedial two years ago. I uh, took part of a cathode ray television uh, coil. This is the electromagnet in the back that um, beams that, trans that uh, guides the electron beams, right? So you can see a picture. I asked the body piercer, this is, I took it from Nigeria, from an old TV that was from Europe, brought it back. I asked the body piercer in Berlin to uh, construct a coil with this, these parts on my belly button. So I basically become um, an e-waste cyborg here. Very much also, um, um, this idea of the waste cyborg, very much also in the sense that I'm not here uh, a high-tech, uh, like, a, like a, you know, a, a human body that is, uh, one more minute, a human body that is now more durable or capable to do amazing things because I've got the latest technology implanted. No, I have electronic waste in the body and it does something that really doesn't serve a utilitarian purpose. I get a magnetic field that goes on and off and you could see it on the magnetometer, but it's so weak that you couldn't do anything with it. So, and very last is what I showed yesterday, a little play with this idea of, um, of the cyborg as well. We tend to think about, as I just said, you know, a human body that's made stronger by putting the latest stuff inside. Here we have an obsolete chip, so a machine part, and we have um, blood taken from my body, so uh, an organic part put together. Um, when the chip heats up, you connect it, the chip heats up, when you have water on it, or blood in this case, when it uh, vaporizes, it slightly cools down the chip. So, but then if we say that the function of this device is to disseminate organic stuff into the space, then the process of dissemination also slows down this actual process. So you could say, you know, it's a bit tenuous, but you could say that this is a very simple cybernetic feedback loop. So this is a cyborg, just to kind of juxtapose. So that's it. Thank you.